Welcome to 10 with Ty, the podcast where I ask the smartest people I know the same 10 questions to unlock the key to their success and hopefully leave a playbook for my daughter and your family too about investing. Now, before we get started, this podcast is general in nature and not intended to be individual financial advice. We always recommend you sit down with your accountant or financial planner before making any financial decisions. Now, let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to 10 with Ty. My next guest is Veronica Morgan. She's the founder of a buyer's agency called Good Deeds Property Buyers. She's a TV presenter, co-host of a successful podcast called The Elephant in the Room, which I believe has just had 1 million downloads, wow, which cuts through the crap of the property market. But I first met Veronica 20 years ago, when she was working on the other side of the fence, and she actually sold my first investment property. Welcome to 10 with Ty, Veronica. <laughs> Thank you. I had forgotten that. Have you? Yeah, 20, fancy forgetting that. Ago. Yeah, God. 20 years ago, how's that make you feel? Well, it feel, makes you feel good because <laughs> yeah. it just it's, you know, reminds me how long I've been doing something along, along inside the property uh, industry for, but also it's yep. nice to be still talking to clients from that long ago. Well, that's right. I'm very wise for, to stay in the industry for that long, you know, hats off, of, hats off to you. But you are one of the OGs of the buyer's agency space, right? Original gangsters. What made you originally first jump from the sell side to the buy side back then? Oh, gee, I think that was old girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, original gangster. Hilarious. Original gangster. So what made me jump? Actually, a couple of things. For starters, I was a sales agent for six years right. and, you know, I was at the top of my game for four of those years in the sense that I was a top producer in my office. And, you know, I enjoyed that and I enjoyed mastering it. But by the end of that fourth year at the top of my game or the sixth year in the, in the business, I was getting bored. You know, I really mm. needed some more mental stimulation. I was thinking about going in business with my principals uh, to open a, a, a sales agency, but I also decided I want to try having a child and, and I managed to get pregnant. So therefore I took a year off. And in that year I was able to, I guess, step back and just look at what it was I really enjoyed about uh, the property industry because I really enjoyed it and I was, I was good at it. Um, and what did I want to do with those skills next? And I guess we're having that, that the benefit of that time, that time distance, um, mm. It was great. And so at the end of that year, well, towards the end of that year, I was approached by somebody that I'd done an appraisal for as a sales agent and they had actually moved, they didn't never sold that property, but they moved overseas and then they wanted to buy another property and wanted to know if I'd represent them. So I looked into it and I thought, look, I could do this. I could do this. And I thought of it as being the other side of the coin. It's a hell of a lot different to just as mm. saying that being on the buyer's agent side is, is just the other half of the equation. There's a lot more involved. But it, in terms of being, um, I guess, a little bit bored with the selling, uh, you know, Groundhog Day thing, it really has, and now it's been, what, 16, nearly 17 years. Wow. And it's really given me a fabulous opportunity to continue to learn and absolutely expand, expand my knowledge and my learning day by day. Still, you know, I, I, I will never know it all. The um, Elephant in the Room with a Million podcast, you must have learned so much hosting that for, what, five years now? Yeah. That has been a gift that I really didn't fully anticipate or appreciate what that could do for me personally when we launched it. So Chris Bates and I, really, we just sort of knew each other from LinkedIn and we really? – we- understood that we both liked the idea of the psychology of, of buying and the psychology of property. And so that was like a common thread and hence, you know, why we went down the path that we did. And I really thought, you know, yeah, we'll, inter- we'll interview people, but I'll be just imparting my knowledge, you know, that arrogance <laughs> that comes. <laughs> <laughs> and, but instead what has actually happened is that my mind has been blown apart. I've learned so much from every single guest, whether I agree with them or disagree with them, doesn't matter. I've learned so much I've uh, my knowledge of property and data and inputs and economics and just so many related things and you know uh, behavioral psychology as well behavioral um uh economics as well has just expanded incredibly and I'm now just on this sort of massive journey of lifelong learning it's exciting you also host a podcast called your first home buyer's guide now, sadly, we've ended up in a situation of a two-tiered society, the haves and the have-nots, haven't we, in terms of real estate and owning real estate, especially in Sydney and Melbourne. 
Mm. What advice can you give someone trying to or struggling to get into the market for the first time? Well, we give a lot of advice on that podcast, of course, but one of the, the key things I would say is that a, a lot of first home buyers get really caught up with listening to the wrong people. And that is dad quite often. You know, how many properties has dad owned or bought over his lifetime? And dads do tend to be a little bit more like you. You're a dad. You're doing this. <laughs> you're doing this. Um, Sometimes mums, but more dad. Um, so by listening to people that might be well-meaning but actually are out of touch with the market and the way things oh, wow. are. So that's sort of the first thing. The second thing that I would advise first home buyers to do is to look at um, who they get advice from So and what, they, what advice they get from those people. Like, for example, mortgage brokers. We absolutely recommend that people use mortgage brokers, but – a lot of mortgage brokers will give property advice for free and they are not property experts. So you have to be very careful. You take finance advice from the mortgage broker, not property advice from the mortgage broker. And another thing that I would say to all first home buyers is be very careful about the grants that you're mm. at taking from the government because government grants of first home buyers have a lot of objectives around them, a lot of reasons for existing, and very few of them are really about helping a first home buyer buy the right property. And what they are, in fact, very much about supporting construction industry and making sure that developments go ahead with pre-sales, et cetera, et cetera. And they're, they're a lot bigger, uh, you know, uh, the the impact on the economy as a whole is a lot, lot yeah. bigger than it is for one little tiny individual first home buyer to make the right decision and yet that is encouraging first home buyers to buy into the riskiest segment of the market and that is the brand new or off the plan segment so you just have to be very very careful about free money from the government feels compelling you want to grab every dollar you can but have to think about false economies here and perhaps if it's going to cost you in the long run because it's forcing you to buy a type of property that you might either yeah. outgrow too quickly because it's too small in the form of an apartment or might actually lose money over time and you're going to get stuck with that and you get stuck on that first rung of the ladder. You've got to be very, very careful. It's funny. When I asked you that question, I, was, I wanted to say something along the lines of, it always seems that the developers seem to get the grant more than the, the purchase, but you kind of said that already without me needing to. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to play 10 with Ty? 10. Go. All right. I've got a buzzer here I'm going to press before I ask you the first question. You ready? My world famous buzzer. <laughs> there you go. All right, Veronica. Question number one. What has been your best investment? <laughs> well, I'm a property person who, who believes in investing outside of property as well as in property, right? So I've owned a number of different properties over the years and I still own some of them. Um, in terms of the property investing, uh, probably in excluding my own home because I think buying your own home is a very good investment decision. Um so excluding my own home would be a semi-detached house that I bought in um, actually in Alexandria in one of a very small part of Alexandria which is more home, more houses than apartments and is very, very well connected and has done very, very well for me. And one day in the future I'll probably renovate it. So it's got potential for capital uplift, in, you know, improvement in that sense. Uh, but it's ticked away very, very nicely. It's always been tenanted. Um and, you know, there's a value add opportunity there. And in the non-property uh, side of things, I've actually I invested in a venture capital fund, which is allied with the real estate industry and in terms of its real estate prop tech. And that's done very well for me, but it's a totally different way of evaluating performance of a property mm. investment. Obviously, you didn't borrow any money to, to invest in that one. Um, as opposed to borrowing a heap of money to buy the house. So you got to measure them differently. Yep, that's, yep. that's had an immediate return, fairly immediate short-term return, which has been very good. Well, there's a lot to be said for your home uh, capital gains tax-free. There's not many countries other than Australia that has that system. Mm. So it's a bit of a no-brainer in, in for us Aussies. Actually, yeah. you know, one of the best investments I ever made was that one that you sold. Ah. Um, because what happened was I was actually the project quantity surveyor on behalf of the bank for that job. It was a Balmain RSL, if you remember right. Yep, I do remember and, it. And I put it down $1,000 on that unit um, and the builder went broke halfway through. And as the project quantity survey, I had to project manage, in essence, the, the finances on the way through and it took a lot longer. And so I think it took about three years to finish. <laughs> and by the time it took that long, the $1,000 that I invested, 
I didn't actually have to put in any um, any deposit because I could back then you could borrow. They actually valued it okay well, and I didn't have to put any of deposit down. So and then I went and you sold it. I think we pulled out. There was actually I went halves with another with a partner, and um, we both pulled out two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred thousand dollars each from our one thousand dollar investment. So as a return over, I think it was like five years, one thousand in, hundred thousand out pretty happy with that. That's fantastic. And interestingly enough, what you've touched on there is that a way to measure return on investment that a lot of people don't do with property, and that is to look at the actual capital that you've put into it, as opposed to the total value of the property when you bought it. Mm. You know, so because you know you put your deposit or like with my Alexandria house, for instance, so I didn't put any cash into that at all. Okay. Same deal. I sort mm. of use equity in my home. Da, da, da. The cash obviously on an ongoing basis until it got to be neutral. You know, yep. that, that was my investment effectively yep, yep. yeah i think probably investors sometimes or the media as well have problems actually understanding profit right i see often in the papers xyz person buys a property off the plan for 600 three months later they sold it for seven hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars that that person just made a hundred thousand dollars no they didn't no they had to pay stamp duty they had to then pay the selling costs marketing costs legals right and then on top of that because they sold it within a year they have to pay 50 percent capital gains tax they didn't make $100,000, Veronica. No. And it annoys me and I'm often yelling at those stories as well and I'm like, or, or they talk about a renovated property and they haven't factored in any of the costs of renovating. I'm like, oh, <laughs> God, what the renovation would have cost more than they made. Give me a break. That's the, that's the block's fault. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of those costs, that's a close I'm like, you're kidding me. I know. Anyway. Yeah, it's a joke. Anyway. All right, question number two. What has been your worst investment? So the very first property that I bought before I knew anything about real estate, I made every single wrong decision. I bought a studio apartment and it was in a great location. It was in sort of on the border of Newtown and Erskineville, but it was a studio. And uh, when I, you know, and I lived in it for a year, but I outgrew it in two seconds. And then I rented it out, rented it out very well. It was actually positively geared uh, or positive cash flow. And um then sold it and it gave me the deposit on house five years later. Okay, so it did its job in that regard. But where I totally failed was, A, the banks changed their lending um, requirement, their lending criteria so that it was less than 50 square metres and in yeah. that intervening time, um, you know, things had changed. So there's no way in a million years I could have held on to it, even though financially I could have held on to it because the rules all changed. But actually worse than that, because, you know, people could say, well, it did, did well. It gave you enough gain in order to be able to buy a house. Yes, it did do that. But that was luck, not good management. I never even looked at whether I could have afforded a bigger place that would have that I could have lived in for longer. I never even really, I didn't even ask how much, what was my borrowing capacity. I just bought that because it felt safe in terms of dollar numbers, you know, it, it felt cheap enough to feel safe. It never occurred to me the risk isn't so much in how much money you borrow, assuming afford a, that you can afford to repay it, but the risk is in the asset that you buy. And mm. so there was a huge amount of risk that I took with that completely unwittingly. And if I bought a better asset, A, I wouldn't have outgrown it so quickly. B, I may not have had to sell it. Like there's a whole raft of things that could have been different. Um, at C, it probably would have made more money because there would have been more buyers able to uh, to, to look at it, whereas it, because the rules changed, it ruled out a whole bunch of other people just like me. You know, when I came to sell it, those people were not even in the mix. It's first time buyers couldn't buy it. So that I would say that's my worst investment. Um, a cheap dog of an asset still a cheap dog, isn't it really? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you wrote something like that on LinkedIn the other day. Yeah. Um, and one of the key, I think you're right, is – when you actually buy an asset, one of the, the key factors should be how much, how quickly can you sell it if it goes pear shaped. Right? Yeah. And if you end up buying somewhere in a rural town that yes, the growth looks good, how long, how quickly can you offload that asset if things are going pear shaped? Mm-hmm. Should be part of the criteria, I reckon. Um, yeah. All right. Question number three. What's been the most valuable investment advice you've ever received? Well, I'm just going to follow on from what you just said because okay. I'm first of all saying the most valuable advice we give, and that mm. is if a property is easy to buy. It potentially could be hard to sell. And buying something that's hard to sell is a bad idea because you are totally reliant on market conditions at the time to be favorable so that it's going to be easy for you to sell, right? Yep. And so what you want is an asset that's always going to be easy to sell. And so, and those properties are hard to buy because everybody yep. wants them, right? So that's what we give in terms of um, valuable investment advice. And I really do think that's valuable. But the in terms of what I've been given, uh, it is to look at property decisions holistically 
And so that means that you need to get advice from, I mentioned earlier for first home buyers, have people in your core, in your corner that give you advice on the things that are relevant. You know, as an investor, you need a, an accountant who understands who understands property investing and is not going to tell you you need to buy a property because you need to just get some negative gearing happening. Um, you need to have a good mortgage broker who would talk to you about uh, about borrowing strategy, not just about chasing the best interest rate. You know, you need to have, I think, ideally a buyer's agent. But if you if you don't have a buyer's agent, if you do, either way, you need to have local expertise to be able to choose a really good asset in an area. Um, you also need to have a good lawyer on hand who also is a property specialist. And particularly if you're buying strata, you need to have a strata specialist. So it's really about that holistic getting, having a good team and those people are all experts in their field and they don't step out of their lane. So that's sort of great advice I was given. And the other thing too is to not make decisions under pressure. We don't make our best decisions when we are stressed or feeling like we have few options. And so mm. that to me has been amazing advice. Haven't always taken no. it and hate <laughs> it sometimes, but it's really good advice. But that's what you would do, wouldn't you, when a client comes to you? you you'd show them your team and share that team with them, wouldn't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yes. yeah. cool. All right, um, question number four. What's your ideal portfolio mix? <laughs> so once again, I'm one of these rare property people who doesn't just believe in investing in property, right? right. So I look, you know, an ideal portfolio mix has your own home in there mm -hmm. and maybe you've got two or maybe three investment properties um, and if, if you have three, don't compromise on the quality of any of those so that you can have more, you know, it's about quality. And if you can only have one, have one. It's better than having two B grade. You know, if you could have one A grade, it's better than having two Bs or three Cs, you know. So, <laughs> um, so your home plus a couple of residential uh, investments if, if um, you know, income cash flow will allow. Also, you want to have, um, I think, shares in, in some form or other right? So uh, I think it's important to look at other investment classes. I think also um, potentially your superannuation, that's mm. obviously a very, and maximizing, uh, you know, the opportunities with superannuation and looking at some alternative investments as well. It's a bit like I mentioned with the, uh, the venture capital fund that I had invested in. That's an alternative investment. So looking at, um, that's a, a holistic portfolio mix. It isn't purely reliant on property. Because property is a lumpy investment, so you sort of do need to diversify. I really like that you are suggesting that people have shares and property because I, I think there's a lot of buyers agency or some advisors out there that just want to help themselves to a certain degree, mm. see how much the property has gone up and try and access that equity and go into the next one. I'm not giving financial advice um, to – not that I don't know. You guys aren't actually licensed financial advisors as buyers no. agency, are you? But – I, did, I didn't mention financial planners, but I should have added that into the holistic mix. Mm. You know, you need mm. to get appropriate advice, particularly with superannuation, um, from uh, appropriately qualified people. And we're not financial planners, but what we will do is say, you know what, you need a whole plan, not just a property plan, and yeah. you need to work with advisors that respect property and how property fits in with the whole picture. But absolutely we'll recommend that people would go down that path of getting yeah. that advice. It definitely should be a bit of a mix. And I would actually say rebalanced if you mm. can um, every two or three years because, you know, asset class go up in different years and periods. And if you're, if you're one asset class has risen so much, it started at 50, it's gone up to 80, maybe it's time to rebalance that portfolio. Well, the problem is with property, it's really impossible to have a balanced. Uh, Depends how many you got. Yeah, well, <laughs> even with one or two, if, you know, in Sydney, for argument's sake, mm, yeah. you know, you've got a couple of properties in Sydney, uh, my my total investment portfolio is completely and utterly unbalanced because the properties just far outweigh. I can leverage to get into property that I haven't done to buy shares. Um, so I know you can, but I haven't. You know, I figure I've got enough borrowing in, in property, but some people would. Uh, but even if you did borrow to get into shares, for example, you're never going to borrow the same proportion. No. So therefore, it's quite difficult to have a balanced portfolio the minute you have property. So my big thing there is you need to really focus on your property investment assets need to be bloody good because you uh, there's opportunity cost in terms of having a balanced portfolio. You can't have it. So therefore, mm. you want to make sure it's as good as you could possibly get it. 
I've had a lot of experience in borrowing sh- uh, money, borrowing shares, borrowing um, leveraging into shares, mm-hmm. and it didn't work out well twice. Um, mm-hmm. I lost. Okay. The, uh, yeah, no, it can be. The problem with borrowing money for shares also. is that your margin calls, right? Yeah. The problem with borrowing that is what happens is you might have some good stocks, but when the market goes down twenty or thirty percent, and that might be your equity, you start chasing your tail, and, mm. and people are just making crazy decisions. Whereas in property, it doesn't occur like that. And so what you end up is getting squeezed, right, down to you either got to come up with a lot of money to put it in to stabilize it or you got to sell stocks. And I made the decision twice to not put any more money in. I had enough in and I just had to sell the stocks and then end up with nothing. Luckily, I never crossed, um, collateralized my properties with my shares. That would, be, would have been a huge mistake. Mm. So, Do you own an investment property? Washington Brown has helped over 250,000 property investors pay less tax with the depreciation schedule. Visit washingtonbrown.com.au to pay less tax today. How would you invest $20,000 as a 20-year-old, Donica? Well, once again, I'm not a financial advisor or financial planner, so I can't advise. But if it was me and I was 20 or yep. it was my daughter and she's 20 and she had 20 grand, ETFs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just straight up, what any any particular one? Just on the ASX? Yeah, I look at probably you know Vanguard or somewhere like that on the yep. on the ASX. Stay in Australia, you could you know go in America, or whatever. But at the end of the day, I would just look at whatever. I'd look at in, index like Thanks. industry indexes as opposed to sort of strange, weird, and wonderful you know <laughs> <laughs> out there weird indexes. But I would I would choose. Uh, the sort of what they call it, the um, market indexes, and mm. that's what I would advise my daughter to do. But I just will couch that by saying I am not a financial planner. Um, so this is generic, generic advice. Not in advice. General. This is just oh, what I would do. Okay. Yep. Um, just so people know, an exchange exchange traded fund represents the basically like the basket of all the stocks on the ASX. And, but you can get different exchange traded funds for different categories. Um, for instance, there's one that I've invested recently called Robots, which invests in AI, mm, right? And yeah. they generally target chip manufacturers and stuff like that. Or you can get it in some, as Veronica said, some weird and wonderful things. It might be um, farming, farming, or it might be, I'm trying to think of some of the weird ones. And also around the world once you can get ones that just focus on Asia or yeah. Asia, Japan, et cetera. So that's what an exchange traded fund is. Okay. Again, not um, um, your not personal advice. investment advice, <laughs> but um, let's say you're 50 years old today, Veronica, um, and you've, just in, you've got no money. You've just inherited $500,000. How would you invest that $500,000 as a 50-year-old? Well, and so much of this depends on your situation. No. So in my current situation, uh, because I have a property in my self-managed super fund plus some shares, um, I would probably pay down. I put three hundred grand. I think that's how much you can put in. So whatever it is that you can put in as a lump sum on your and your super, whatever the rules are at the time, I would put a big chunk of it because I am over, I am over fifty now, and so that for me is becoming more important to to mm. have no debt. That for me, that's my personal um, plan. So therefore, I would aim to get that debt down and I'd pretty much pay off the debt on that property actually so I wouldn't have much left so that's 300 of it and the rest of it well you could potentially uh, look at funding a property investment depending on how much equity you've got in your own home or for me I might look at using that 200 grand to um, in to renovate uh, that house in Alexandria I was talking about before because that's ready for an update that house so mm. I might use that to um, up lift uh, a property that I already have, that's probably what I personally would do it. In terms of general approach, some people, uh, if they were given 500 grand and they paid their house off for argument's sake and-, and Let's say they've got nothing. Let's say they've got zero dollars and they've just- Yeah, and they've got Buy 500. A Buy a home? Buy a home. Okay. Mm. And live in it? Yep, and live in it. Because you know, investment properties. No way, not in a million years. Because well, <laughs> the thing is, that as you get older, you know, you don't want to go into. Re- I don't think you want to go into retirement not having your own home. Personally, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I just think that it's a very risky place to be, and it's very easy to become homeless in this country, as it turns out. So I would, I'd be looking at security. If I was fifty, had nothing, was given five hundred grand, I would buy myself a home, hmm. and I I, and so. if I could. Obviously, borrow because you know it's a good chunk. But I'd look at 
what could I borrow at maybe with a 15-year mortgage, maybe 20 mm. years, like that, whatever the banks will, would give me. Mm. I'd look yep. at that. And, but, you know, you think, well, I'm paying rent now if I don't have if anything. So I'd be looking at investing that money into it as well. Yep. Good. What would you tell your 20-year-old self about investing? If you could go back in time and see 20-year-old Veronica, tap you on your shoulder, Veronica, listen to this. What would you say? Oh, compounding. The magic of compounding, do you know, and the dollar, co- the dollar cost averaging, right? Start mm. small and do it regularly. That's mm. what I'd be saying. Watch this thing grow. Watch this snowball. It's amazing. It's a modern day mm. miracle. And so I guess on that, that's similar to I would have, I would have reinvested. I would have bought a lot of bank because banks never lose money. We've got this society of, um, you know, the four pillar society, which we banks in this country are protected, right? I reckon I would have. Um, just invested in a lot of banks and reinvested those dividends. The same principle yeah. as compounding interest, right? Um, dividend reinvestment. Well, I reinvest uh, all my dividends. So yep. my job could probably do debt recycling, but I haven't done that. And that's 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 a little bit, that's something I want to look into. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question number eight. What legacy do you want to leave your family or your community, Veronica? Well, you know, this is interesting. I... Um, my legacy, I really want to be known as the truth seeker, right? Okay. And I get that there's often more than one truth, right? But mm. the thing is in the property game, there is so much spin. There mm. is so much self-interest. There is so much, um, you know, blowing the trumpet of um, recent decisions, recent acquisitions with no track record to back it up, no no evidence to show that these were good decisions you made for your clients or whatever. You know, there's just... There's always the latest and greatest new fad in terms of, you know, what investors on the forums are chasing, you know, this year. You go back 10 years, go back 20 years, you'll find the same types of conversations, the same types of thinking. You know, it's all the same, right? And there's always going to be charlatans, the snake oil salespeople that have always got the latest and greatest, the quick, the, the, you know, the silver bullet to making heaps of money, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and <laughs> so my legacy is that, that really it is not that complicated, but it's boring, right? Good decisions are pretty boring and there's no flash and cash and dash with it. It's just, it's understanding fundamentals and it's just making good, solid, sound decisions, right? And so that's what I want my legacy to be, to help people who want to make good decisions actually know that there are ways to learn about doing things a way that will help them with out good outcomes in the long term because that's what property is all about. Yeah. And I'm not one of these flash dash cash grab type people. <laughs> and <laughs> so that's my, my, my legacy. But I get that the vast majority of people want an easy way out. They mm. want it to be, you know, to want it to be easy. They don't really want things to be difficult. They want things to be, you know, quick. And, and I get that my message will not appeal to them. But for mm. those who get it, for those whose little antennas going off going, you know what, it just seems too good to be true. It seems to just something a bit off about it. That's my legacy is to be there for those people. Because mm. I think you can certainly get sucked in um, of some of the stuff I see in my feed, right, from uh, certain people. And it'll be like, bought a property for 200, um, market value 300, current rent 600, contact us now. I'm like, Hang on, you paid two hundred for it. It's worth two hundred. Mm. <laughs> Brent, and prove to me that it's, it's and that, it, that the rent six hundred. I just don't believe it. But I can see how people get sucked in. Instant equity uplift. There's a word. Yeah, <laughs> it's like really no. You pay two hundred. It's in Shitsville, and it's yeah. still worth two hundred, right? And you pay two hundred because it was easy to buy, yeah. right? And that's yeah. why you can buy these these charlatans, these snake oil salespeople can either help you buy so many of them, you know, because. Yeah. They're not hard to buy. Yeah. Well, they haven't gone up a hundred grand or fifty grand or whatever. Because at the end of the day, would someone else pay more for them? No. No. <laughs> exactly. All right. Question number nine. Now, for the outside world, you do look successful. You've oh. got a successful buyers agency. You're an incredible podcast host. Um, but what does success look like to you, Veronica? Mm-hmm. Good question. As I do get older, I mean, I realise that. Really, for me personally, deep connections with people that I care about, that is success, like deep personal relationships. And I've got some, some you know, obviously my family, my loved ones, my my close, friend, my close friends, um, but also, you know, in my business, you know, I've got some clients that have become friends over the years and we become 
we actually become their 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 family buyers agents you know i mean mm. that's deep and then we get to understand so much more about their lives and add to that but just generally speaking authentic connections are so important to me so it doesn't really matter whether it's business or whether it's personal i just not into fluff and bullshit you know i i like Hopefully I can swear on this. Um, Absolutely. So that for me is success, right? Mm. And therefore really knowing at the core of me who I am and what I stand for, what my values are, and and I, it doesn't make life necessarily easy all the time, mm. <laughs> but it mm. sort of does simplify mm. things a bit. Um, and a satisfied life, like, you know, because – I, you know, I do a lot and and people often say, how do you get so much done? I'm interested in what I'm doing. I'm not doing it because um, I feel I have to. I'm on this sort of this, you know, the, the hamster wheel. I'm doing it because I'm invigorated by it and I'm interested in what I do. Uh, but I also have passions in life as well. And so I'm actually literally at the moment looking at, I'm rereading this book called Design Your Life because I'm wanting to incorporate some of those passions into you know, more of my work as well. So I like sustainability for argument's sake. Okay. Um, food, like really enjoy cooking. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's around doing what I love and I'm fortunate enough that my work, I'm able now to spend a lot of time thinking about sort of coming up with um, new content or more ideas or different ways of looking at things, different ways of helping people make decisions and frameworks and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, so time to think. That's certainly something that I look at as being uh, the hallmark of a successful life. It's, it's most, most of the – no one's actually said, oh, X, Y, Z money or whatever. A lot of the answers that I've got from this has been family and connections and it makes sense, especially, I guess, as you get older, like you, once you've got money, you kind of – it's more about your family and friends. Like I've got a group of friends, believe it or not, still from school, um, which I'm pretty proud of, and there's about 40 of us to wow. catch up that's once amazing. a year, and that's from like high school. Mm. And one of, our, one of our friends passed away recently from suicide, so we've made a pact that every first – first game of the NRL we're going to get together and it's just going to grow and grow and grow and it's just all school friends and that's for me a sign of success just having that many school friends still as friends yeah that's pretty impressive you know I'm actually going to a wedding this weekend a couple of school oh, a school friend and, and his husband to be and you know with two other school friends and yeah same deal we had a trip down to Beechworth the, the gang of us um back in May it was wonderful mm. and, and to have that and we're all very different but we mm. just have this we laugh oh my god it was the most joyful weekend it was fantastic but I think too it's funny what you say about the money it's pretty hard I mean part of the ability to enjoy these things is by mm. making good decisions and working hard younger. And so there's some of this stuff we do take a bit for granted. And I think, you know, that having money does make it easier. I'm certainly not rolling in it, but I'm not uncomfortable. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, mm. yeah. um, it does make it easier to step back and to be able to be less, I guess, panicked and frantic about trying to make ends meet. Yep, yep. And it gives you the opportunity for freedom to do podcasts as well exactly. and to travel and to go to Europe for two months, et cetera. Yeah, so, for two yeah. months. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Now, the next question is, I guess, part of the reason why I started this podcast, because my father lost all his money and seeing that was pretty painful. Um, so Warren Buffett is quoted as saying, rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, never forget rule number one. Veronica, what's your best strategy to not lose money? recognize risk and where okay. risk really lies, right? So with property, there's a lot of myths around. For example, people say you've got to diversify. So then they'll be going or buying three C-grade properties rather than one A-grade property. You know, they, they a bit like with my first property, they think the risk is in how much money you borrow, but it's actually in the risk is the asset you buy. So with when it comes to property, people are chasing hotspots. They're trying to find the next the next place is going to take off because it will make them feel good about you know whatever decisions that they're making. But the problem is they're not recognizing is that you're only buying one property at a time. Seventy one percent of property investors in this country, according to the ABS, only have one investment property. If you're going to buy one, it has to be the best bloody asset you can possibly find in the safest location you can possibly find. And that means not speculating, you know, and this is the problem in property. People speculate far too much. And this is what it gets back to that being boring, you know, <laughs> it's not just like there's boring things to look for. Boring is good when it comes to property. I don't mean 
boring mean homogenous and boring property. I mean, but boring in terms of finding a property in an area that has de- demonstrated its ability to provide sustainable growth over time. It has the elements that mean people are always going to want to live there because it's it's not a, you know, a hot spot or a ripple effect type suburb. It's got its own reasons, the reasons people want to live there. People who live there can afford to buy property there right and then and they want to buy property there and when the market tightens up the type of property in those areas where there's always people that would want it you know that where there's always demand for quality property and this is the thing the art is being able to cut through these area any suburb you decide to buy in it's like a hot butter through knife sorry hot knife through butter <laughs> <laughs> right to understand an area well enough to be able to identify the type of property that will always get buyers you know hmm. and that's not risky you know but people think oh it's risky going to auction and competing for a property now, it can be risky if you pay way too much for it, but if you've done your research and you've chosen a good a good asset and you've priced it and you set your limit before you go to auction, et cetera, et cetera, you can mitigate those risks because you know you've got confidence you're buying a really good asset. And so that's the one thing, you know, back to Warren Buffett's quote, you know, aiming never to lose money. I think people, one of my favourite reports is the CoreLogic's pain and gain report, right? So that comes out every quarter and it reflects how many, properties uh, resales were in that quarter and how many of them sold at a loss Hmm. that's a nominal loss it doesn't even take into account holding costs and stamp duty and renovation costs and stuff like that and so like in the last report was march 2023 i think on top of my head it was something like nine percent sold at a loss that's only ten percent of properties sell at a loss right Hmm. so it's hugely risky and i think that's the problem with properties people aren't understanding what it is that's risky and it is in the asset selection. If you don't know how to select a good asset, you are taking way more risk than you probably need to. That is a good segue into my next question. I know there's 10 with tie, um, but I do always ask a, a surprise question based upon your ex- <laughs> your, ex- uh, your, um, your experience. And I think I'm, you might have just answered either one or two of them. But my, ne- my final question to you was, what are the three worst mistakes property investors make? When uh, what, what, are, what are the three worst mistakes property investors make? Yeah, I think number one is that they 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 put too much importance on location, and look, location is important. It is, but if you if you only go for location and you don't understand that within every single location there's underperformers and overperformers, you're missing the biggest trick in property investing. Hmm. So if you can combine those two things, you know, and this is where people rely too heavily on data. So second, so first thing is their over reliance on location without understanding that within a location, even in a great location, you can lose money. Right. The second thing is that they um, they over rely on data, and it's a little bit like saying, right, well, I only believe one form of transport exists, and you should use it, and it's the train. Right, love a train, but the train will get you to the station in a suburb, and then once you get off that train, you're limited with what your two little legs can get you in terms of how far you can go. Whereas if you think, okay, well, I'm going to think holistically here. I'm going to use the data, the train, to get me to the train station, but I'm also going to think about maybe I don't know, ride a bike for a bit, or perhaps I'll you know get an Uber, or maybe I'll even get in a car, whatever. But you're adding some local knowledge and the nuances that you will gain from getting away from just where as far as the data can get you the data has its limitations Mm -hmm. and people you know property investing is risky people realize it's risky and so they will put over reliance on data and not understand that you need to under you need to know the nuances of local areas to make good decisions on assets so that's on the same thing and thirdly this i you know without thinking with a long-term lens some investors really stretch themselves far too much financially so that if things get tough they're forced to sell yep and that is not a good idea you want to crack an asset and you want to you want to hold on to that thing come hell or high water because you know it's a cracker asset so you don't want to have to push yourself to the limit and so then you're forced to sell a cracker asset now if you've got a dud asset get rid of it right? Mm. Mm. <laughs> but if you got a cracker, do everything you can do to keep it. So I think that's something that I, I, I see a lot in, you know, property investment forums. There's all this idea of the minute you got a little bit of equity, go and borrow more money. And then they go, and, they go and borrow, they buy shit. They buy a lot of shit. <laughs> so what you really mean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Off the cuff, what a great answer. 
Um, that comes to the end of Ten with Ty, Veronica. Ooh, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for imparting your knowledge on, on, on the audience. Um, I've really enjoyed it and uh, thank you. And if anyone would like to get in contact with Veronica, just head to veronicamorgan.com.au. If you own an investment property, then Washington Brown can help you pay less tax with an ATO-compliant depreciation schedule. Visit washingtonbrown.com.au to pay less tax today. Mm-hmm.